Hello, everybody. Today, I'm going to tell you about a project that we undertook at Uber that demonstrates why privacy engineering is not just for privacy engineers. So I'm not a privacy expert. At Uber, I lead a team of more than 500 engineers in an organization called Product Platform. We're responsible for the company's business infrastructure, including platforms and tools for things like growth, communication, and customer care. We also build the infrastructure, platform, and tools that power Uber's analytics data. I've never worked in a privacy or security team, so why should you all listen to what I have to say? Well, it's because my team and teams like mine and companies might possibly be the toughest critics that privacy professionals will encounter. And that's not because we don't believe privacy is important. In fact, we're deeply committed to protecting the privacy of our customers' data. But my team is often on the receiving end of technical and policy requirements from privacy teams. Translating those privacy policies into engineering requirements can be very challenging. We have responsibilities to the business, so we may push back or be resistant to new ideas. We're going to scrutinize your requirements, and we're going to kick the tires on anything you propose. In the end, your ability to convince people like me is critical to getting your projects approved and deployed into production. So I'm not here today to tell you why privacy is important or unveil a new algorithm. Instead, I'm going to tell you about some of the things that worked in convincing me and my team to turn a research project out of our privacy engineering team into an important part of our overall privacy strategy. So let me start by saying a few words about the data environment at Uber. Uber does million of millions of trips per day in hundreds of cities around the world. We have multiple modes of transportation that are implemented by different lines of business. To operate all this at scale, we need services that provide precise, reliable, and actionable data to the business. These services, in turn, create additional data, all of which must be properly managed. So the data infrastructure that powers all of this is complex. This is a, a simplified view. So we have several different databases that store online data, and these are shown in green, um, including a MySQL-based sharded data store. We also use standard relational databases like Postgres and MySQL to store additional information like city names, approved vehicle types, and things like that, while other data is streamed in through Kafka. Real-time data flows through the stream processing system and real-time analytics engine. Batch data is ingested into HDFS, the Hadoop file system, transformed into various different kinds of data tables. A subset of the most important tables are then loaded into a Vertica data warehouse. Both the batch and real-time data is used to power business intelligence tools, our machine learning platform, and our experimentation platform. The data is used as inputs into business critical services like writer driver matching, security and fraud detection, forecasting, just to name a few. We also have multiple query engines that run SQL queries for different types of applications. So Presto and Vertica that you see there in uh, pink um, are used for interactive analyses, including things like dashboards and ad hoc analysis. Hive, that's also there in pink, um, is used for batch analytics to deal with larger data sets, ETL workloads, and log processing. Spark is a non-SQL engine that's also used for different types of data processing. So the project that I'm going to be discussing today focuses mostly on the batch systems. Note that we use a range of different techniques to implement security and privacy across this entire stack. And what I'm discussing today is a specific project and not meant to be a comprehensive overview of everything we do. So going into a bit more details on our Hadoop environment, this diagram shows the architecture for access control for our Hadoop data infrastructure. A trusted admin creates the policies through a policy platform. Those policies are registered in a policy store and converted into extended ACLs in HDFS. Access control enforcement happens at the HDFS layer, at the file system layer. 
all types of accesses, regardless of where they're coming from, goes through this HDFS policy enforcement. So at Uber, privacy is a shared responsibility across organizations and requires close collaboration across multiple different engineering disciplines. The data team works closely with the privacy engineering team, which has about a dozen privacy engineers and architects, which sit in a larger engineering security organization that reports up to Uber CISO. The privacy engineering team is responsible for things like providing standardized platforms and services to internal stakeholders and educating product and engineering teams about privacy policies and best practices. In particular, the privacy engineering team helps translate privacy requirements into engineering tasks. When the privacy engineering team first approached us to discuss a new privacy platform, they described the basic privacy principles that were non-negotiable based on the concepts of least privilege, data minimization, and regulatory compliance. Specifically, any platform needs to limit access based on role and job responsibility, ensure that data is retained for legitimate purposes and only used for those purposes. We must also retain certain data for legal requirements, and data that's retained must be protected from bad actors. We also need to comply with the regulatory right to be forgotten. Implementing these principles efficiently and at scale in a complex environment such as ours poses no shortage of technical challenges. As we analyze these requirements and discuss possible solutions for the new platform with the privacy engineering team, we realized that a starting point for this solution already existed at Uber. This solution is based on a tool that privacy engineering team had originally built for differential privacy back in 2016 and has since open sourced a number of its components. Differential privacy allows general statistical analyses to be performed without revealing information about any one individual in the data set. It's implemented by adding noise to a query's result. Some of this work was shared here at Enigma last year by the researchers at Berkeley who worked with Uber in building this system. The key idea was that this differential privacy tool rewrites the queries on the client side and sends a private query to the database, which returns the differentially private result. The privacy engineers suggested that this query rewriting technique could be used for a larger range of data privacy problems, not just differential privacy. Not surprisingly, my team and I were originally skeptical about whether or not this would work in production. It couldn't parse complex queries we were worried. Uh, we had too many SQL variants in our ecosystem for this to be practical. And we, were wor and we were worried that the rewriting would add overhead and not scale in production. Well, the privacy engineering team convinced us to at least collaborate on a prototype. We found the approach compelling because it gives the flexibility to apply multiple different policies into queries in real time. And because it was implemented on the client side and sits outside the data store, it's non-intrusive, so lower risk to try out and experiment with. So I'm now gonna discuss a few details of this implementation. So we use the query rewriting mechanism to develop a more comprehensive data retrieval privacy tool we call ABC. ABC is an acronym from its three key components, a library to parse and rewrite the queries, another library that holds business logic, and a service API. Queries come in via the data tools and go through a federated query proxy service. It sends the query to ABC, which either rewrites the query or rejects it outright. Rewritten queries are then sent to the database and the results return back to the user. With data retrieval privacy, we can now implement multiple different dimensions of data privacy. Table level privacy and security are implemented at the Hadoop infrastructure level. But within a table, columns containing sensitive data 
are identified and any non-authorized queries trying to access those columns are rewritten to mask them out. Specific rows in the tables can also be filtered out. For example, to implement time-based privacy controls um, in order to only return results that have uh, data that was created within a certain time range. There's also logic to determine whether or not a query should be rewritten at all. So users, teams, and groups are assigned particular roles based on their job function. Policies for those roles are registered in a policy store. So when users run queries, they only see the data for which they're authorized. So here's a simple example of what this query rewriting looks like. If an unauthorized user tries to run a query, that looks up the name of a customer, for example, that query is rewritten to mask out the name. So data retrieval privacy using query rewriting allows a spectrum of different privacy algorithms to be applied. So you can implement basic access control via column rewriting. You can implement time-based policies with row filtering. And then you can even layer on more sophisticated differential privacy controls. So being able to parse the queries is a prerequisite for any of this. Once you're able to parse the queries, you can then rewrite them and apply any of these techniques. So now going back to my team's original concerns about whether or not this parsing approach would work into production. So we ended up developing parsers for each SQL variant that we have in our data ecosystem. When we started out, the initial parse rates were below 50%, showing that my team's original concerns were not completely unfounded. But we worked through the cases one by one and now have a, parse, a success rate for the parsing that's, a, that's 99% plus. We were also originally concerned that the added latency of rewriting these queries uh, would add too much overhead. However, we found that in practice, the rewritten queries return less data, so they often run even faster than the original queries. So ABC fits into the larger data architecture to give us a layered approach to privacy. Access control at the infrastructure level is coupled with data retrieval privacy to give us the flexibility to Im implement policies at multiple different granularities. The majority of the accesses come through, come through as SQL queries, so pass through ABC. We then rely on the data infrastructure mechanisms for non-SQL engines. So I want to finish out the talk by discussing how the privacy engineering team convinced us to take on this project. Ultimately, this project worked out well because the two teams collaborated very closely on the design and implementation. So the privacy engineering team trusted the data team's expertise in things like data storage systems, query engines, and data tools, as well as our knowledge of how data is used across the business. The query rewriting privacy technique got easier buy-in because it was first implemented on the client side and layered on top of the existing data infrastructure. Even if down the road we decide to integrate it more tightly in the infrastructure, Starting with this non-intrusive approach makes it a lot easier to prototype and iterate on the implementation. The privacy engineering team brought their expertise on masking, anonymization, query filtering techniques, and insight into the latest privacy ideas. The privacy engineering team put skin in the game by investing their own engineering resources, as opposed to only specifying requ requirements or handing us a prepackaged tool that we would then have to retrofit into our existing infrastructure. For any data privacy pro project, we found it useful to create a virtual team with members from the necessary organizations. Keeping this team small, at least initially, allowed for easier flow of information. Uh, the projects like this, of course, need management support, but it's easier to accomplish that if the resource commitment is modest in the early stages and the project is low risk to start with. The team can always grow later as the ideas are proven out. So in summary, we built privacy into the data stack with a layered approach. 
we were able to bring together expertise from multiple different teams uh, in order to make this a success. We kept the core team small and focused, which allowed ideas to flow well and for problems to be solved quickly. This enabled us to successfully take this project from concept to production and become an important part of our overall privacy strategy at Uber.